here. Over to you, Janine. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Todd. Uh, my name is Janine Bonilla. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here at Clear Up. So uh, just a few things. If you guys have any questions, we will hold those till the end, but submit those questions in the bottom right-hand corner where you see the three shapes, the triangle, square, and circle. Once you click on those, you'll see a little section that says Q&A. That's where we'd like you to put those questions and then we'll get to those in the end. So without further ado, I would love to introduce to you our host today. Um, he is the Endowed Professor of Advanced Technologies at the Community College of Allegheny County, where he develops materials to rapidly upskill the workforce, focusing on AI, automation, and Industry 4.0 and other cutting-edge fields. Before joining the college, Justin Starr was CTO of Red Zone Robotics Incorporated, a manufacturer of water and wastewater inspection robots and asset management software. Dr. Starr has also worked on several DARPA programs with Kinetic North America's Technology Solutions Group. He has issued 12 US patents in AI, VR, AR, and robotic systems, and works as a consultant to multiple water and wastewater tech companies, municipalities, and government agencies. Justin earned his PhD and MS in materials engineering from the University of Florida. He has a BS in engineering science from the University of Virginia, and his AS in business management from CCAC. So welcome, Dr. Starr. Hey, thanks, Janine. Shit, that's a tough, uh, it's a tough introduction, right? The bar that was of a lot. That was a lot. I know, right? <laughs> Geez, say it out loud. Who is this guy? Um, but hey, everyone, thanks, y'all. It's really nice to be talking about uh, smart sewers today, a little bit about how AI um, can change the game in terms of what's going on. So um, this is something that I'm pretty passionate about. I, um, uh, you know, have been in the sewer industry for quite a long time now. And uh, for me, seeing how AI um, and other advanced technologies can be used to kind of change the game for um, TV inspection uh, is pretty interesting to me. So like Janine said, if y'all have questions, feel free to put them in the chat uh, or the Q&A. If things look particularly relevant, I'll try and hit them, you know, as soon as uh, they come up, if it's like related to a slide. But if it's like, how would this work in my municipality? Let's save that till the end because you care about your municipality, but a lot of other people might not care so much. So um, just making the, the most of everyone's time. So, you know, I feel like I've done this talk um, a lot and I don't know everyone's background in the room. If y'all engineers, you get this. If y'all work for municipalities, you get this. If you're just like looking for something to do on a Thursday, uh, you might not be aware of just how degraded critical infrastructure is. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, so we made the news when our bridge collapsed. Um, and we have this thing that we do where we build bridges under bridges to catch like the reinforced concrete as the rebar rust and the chunks fall off. So like got our own things going on. But what's wild is that those are the problems you can see underground. I mean, it's a lot worse, right? Um, and we just don't talk about it because we don't see the evidence of degradation until a catastrophic failure occurs, right? We all see spalling on a bridge. We all see concrete chunks falling down, but you can have a reinforced concrete pipe that's lost, you know, 30% of its wall thickness. And you don't even know until a sinkhole opens up um, or you happen to be TVing the line uh, underground. But, you know, just like the scope of the problem is immense. I know the Biden administration just noted they're going to spend on water infrastructure. I mean, this figure is old, right? I think it's from a couple of years ago. It just keeps going up. $300 billion to spend to really clean things up. You can see here a great example of a reinforced concrete pipe, the rebar cage, totally visible, degrading from H2S conversation or H2S corrosion. Uh, we see some aggregate that's not only visible, but falling out of a pipe vitrified clay falling, giant root ball. I mean, the problems are immense um, and they just keep getting worse and worse, uh, which is interesting. And I think one of the big challenges is that, you know, let's say we would all get together and say, well, let's fix the problem, right? Even if we wanted to, there's been so much deferred maintenance that I don't know where you live, but where I live, like if we wanted to legit go in and fix everything, rate payers would not have the stomach to swallow that increase, even if it's spread out over 20 years. And the same goes for elected officials. So we're sort of in this state where triage has become the name of the game. And some of it is like we didn't know. You know what I mean? Like when we did reinforce concrete for the first time, Everyone thought the lifespan was going to be something, and then H2S kind of caught us by surprise. So we live and learn as we go. Pre-stressed concrete, some other surprises there when wires would break early. But I mean, we just we can't fix it all right now, right? Even if we do the Biden plan and all the infrastructure money comes, um, 
you know, it's just, it's, it's not palatable. And just an example of that where I'm from is Alcasan in Pittsburgh, great um, sanitary authority, Allegheny County, been under a consent decree for a long time because the overflow from their combined system every time it rains. Just they released something a few years ago about a plan to fix, you know, um, a long-term control plan. And I mean, it's a $2 billion plan where they are going to build a system of parallel interceptors to really fix the problem, right? And if you do the math, that parallel interceptor plan means if you're a rate payer, you're looking at a 12 to 10, a 10 to 12 percent increase in your rate every year, which uh, if you do the math over time, your sewer bill is going to double every seven years, meaning for a typical homeowner, right? Seven, 14, 21 years, your sewer payment could be more than your mortgage, which is, you know, totally unpalatable. And so Alcazar, to their credit, right, like they've done a lot of things to uh, introduce green infrastructure and some innovative technologies that can prevent the overloading of those interceptors. But, you know, the point remains that fixing all these problems, you know, one and done might be nice to do, but we don't have the literal capital or the political capital to do it. So we're sort of at an interesting inflection point, and I don't like to be a Debbie Downer, but sometimes you can't help it, um, where you know we might have had wastewater infrastructure that's been uh, on the cusp of failing, according to those um, American Society of Civil Engineer report cards, right? They always release these report cards like, oh, American sewers get a C minus or a D. And we all think like, yeah, yeah, it's sort of a shame to have a D and it's really sad. Um, but you know, nothing was really happening, right? We have a D severely degraded sewer. How much longer can we let that go by? We're at the point now where we realize the difference between a D and an F is that fine line between everything seeming fine on the surface and catastrophic failure, right? When you look at some of these large sinkholes that occur from a, a ruptured sanitary sewer line or combined sewer line, it eats away all the surface. You have major arteries in big cities where a sinkhole could lead to significant loss of life, millions of dollars in damage, um, and disruption that could snarl major transit arteries uh, you know, for weeks while repairs are performed. We've seen some areas where um, uh, people have died. There have been fatalities where people have fallen in sinkholes caused by um, degraded sewer lines. Uh, outside Detroit in Fraser Township, giant sinkhole in 2016. They had to run this parallel interceptor on the surface while they did major repairs. Um, and it wasn't like anyone was malicious, right? There's not terrorist attacks causing this. It's just we put in interceptor sewers in some cases in the 20s and 30s. Uh, they had an 80 year design life and it's up, right? It is over. And we haven't really planned for how to rehab that infrastructure. So what does that mean right now? It's all doom and gloom. It means that um, one of the best things you can do as a municipality is have a proactive TV inspection program, right? If you don't have enough money to dig up and replace all your sewers or line all your pipes or whatever you wanna do, um, take a TV truck and go through and look at everything in your system, right? If you take a TV truck and you start inspecting your system, you can develop a proactive plan for actual repair and rehabilitation, right? And a lot of us, hopefully at this webinar, are aware of proactive CCTV, but I go to conferences with small municipalities and uh, municipal governments, and I encounter a lot of folks who don't have proactive CCTV, right? It's just not something they do. And so just making the case for this, right? If you have um, you know, multiple lines that you uh, haven't inspected in some time, um, you know, what can you do? You can do math and say, well, I'm going to inspect everything in this basin or this drainage area. Or I'm going to say anything installed before 19, whatever, I'm going to go take a look at. But the condition of sewer lines depends a lot on local factors, right? It could have been a particular contractor doing the installation. There could be uh, some soil compaction issue. You could have a Chinese restaurant that doesn't use their grease trap and dumps all the grease down and you're going to get failure that occurs more quickly. Some manholes might have a weird geometry where there's um, turbulence in the water and H2S corrosion is worse. So, you know, you do this proactive TV inspection and it can save a ton of money. And I don't work for the TV truck companies, or I don't work for Envirocyte, I don't sell cameras, but like this rule of fives really applies to um, wastewater infrastructure, which is that every time maintenance is deferred, the cost goes up by about 5X. So if you notice a defect and don't address it and then circle back in a year, now the cost of repairing that defect could go up by five times. If you ignore it again, it goes up by five again. And a municipality I worked with a number of years ago did better math than this rule of thumb, right? Rule of fives is interesting and catchy. 
but Arlington, Texas found that every dollar they were able to save on their O&M budget freed up eight to eleven dollars in new capital spending and because these guys were growing mean, texas you know everything's growing new subdivisions all the time a strategic approach to o m and preventing backups and preventing blockages really put them in a position where uh, they could fund the necessary uh, expansion of their system to cope with population growth and they're a great case study in how to you know leverage proactive inspection to minimize recurring O and M costs, right? They had programs, and a lot of people do, where they would just clean everything every couple of years, right? Well, proactive CCTV means you can look at everything and then only clean the things that need to be clean, right? So instead of going clean to TV, do your inspections and only clean what needs to be cleaned. And some places um, that I've been a consultant for have found that eighty percent of their lines actually don't need to be cleaned. So take that saving and you know upgrade of uh, you know something at the treatment plant that needs to be done. So whatever, there's a lot of things uh, that can be done with this proactive TV inspection. Fort Worth, another example, right? They started doing proactive CCTV, uh, reduced their cleaning costs by four point six million and emergency repairs by 1.9 million, right? If you can fix something before it causes that sinkhole, the cost of repair and remediation goes way down because you don't have to deal with traffic control, major arteries. Um, most of us get this if we're in the TV inspection game um, in the sewer industry. So, um, you know, there's a, a couple statistics on that, but then we run into a problem, right? And the idea of proactive TV inspection is great because you think, ah, I'm gonna look at all my lines, I'm gonna find all my problems, but there's this bottleneck in the system, right? Where maybe you buy a TV truck and you have a great crew and that crew is going to go out there and they're going to collect 1500 feet of data. Or if you use the red zone solos, maybe you're getting 10,000 feet a day of data, right? Maybe, maybe the solo gets stuck and you have to free it, but whatever you could do it. Um, but regardless, you get a couple trucks out there and now all of a sudden you get a lot of TV footage coming into an office where someone has to watch it, review it, uh, make sure there's no mistakes and actually make decisions for prioritizing repair and rehabilitation, right? So you imagine a good TV truck, traditional TV truck, um, not an autonomous robot, 1,500 feet a day. I feel like that's a good number. You have three of them going 4,500 feet a day. What do you do back in the office, right? Do you have uh, a team of people that's going to watch 4,500 feet of sewer video every day to figure it out? What if your operators out there collecting uh, data are new to PACP coding or they make mistakes or everyone has a bad Friday every once in a while? What if they miss critical defects and so they inspect the line and it doesn't get on that repair or rehab schedule? All of a sudden, getting all of this data is not necessarily a solution to um, the challenge of planning a comprehensive inspection program, right? So just TVing doesn't necessarily guarantee savings. You have to act on that data in a smart way. And I'm just listing some problems you might see if you've adopted comprehensive CCTV inspection programs. You shove out the work, low bid. Hey, sometimes that low bid, there's a reason it's low bid, right? Sometimes you have a rock star who does a great job. Sometimes you have uh, someone who's new to the job, right? And so really the challenge becomes this office where you have to get through all this inspection data and man, is it tough? You know what I mean? And I just show some screenshots from platforms. I show red zone icon. Cause when I was at red zone, that's what we use. I think it's wind can over here, but like, man, some of these software packages are rough and I don't want to say that they're all rough, but like some of them you use them and you can see whoever did the UI design, like, was inspired by Windows XP and Clippy, like that's what it looks like. And it doesn't matter, you know what I mean? Software can look however it looks, if it gets the job done, it's fine. But a more fundamental problem is these local Windows tools, these desktop applications that were designed in maybe the early 2000s or the 2010s really weren't equipped to deal with large quantities of data, right? You take a time machine back to 2004 and someone using WinCan 7 and you tell them, hey, guess what? In the next couple of years, we're gonna have high definition televisions, your video files are gonna be two gigabytes and you're gonna inspect your entire system and you're gonna have like a couple terabytes of data you're gonna have to deal with, right? They would have no idea. Person back then, not a clue. They're just thrilled they made the leap from VHS tapes to digital video, right? So it's just, we're sort of in trouble. And the answer to solving this problem uh, looks like it could be artificial intelligence, right? 
And if you haven't worked with AI, you think AI is a good future thing in a couple years, we're all be self-driving Teslas, but AI is something you can deploy today. And there's quite a few firms on the market that are using AI to improve uh, water and wastewater inspection practices. So just to give you a sense of how much change has occurred in really the past decade, right? Go back to 2015, right? 2015 doesn't seem that long ago because COVID messed with our sense of time. We think, oh, a couple years ago, actually nine years ago, right? 2015, what's going on? If you're doing AI in 2015, you're literally a CMU or a MIT PhD scientist inventing your own algorithms and doing whatever. You know what I mean? In 2015, we had uh, Amazon Alexa come out for the first time. Siri, PMU's entering a team in the World Series of Poker that's doing AI, right? It's crazy. You had to really be an egghead to get it done. 2024, AI is everywhere, right? We've got ChatGPT. We've got all this stuff that, you know, you don't have to know AI to use AI. You can log on to ChatGPT now and probably do, I don't know, it depends on what your job is, but 30% of your work by just asking ChatGPT a series of questions. And so what it means is AI has left that realm of the computer scientist and it's become democratized so we can all use it uh, and pretty quickly do things like spin up uh, image classifiers. So the school where I work, right, we make uh, facial classifiers, things that can look at a room full of students, figure out who's who and take attendance. And we do that as a, a project in class, right? And I'm at a community college. I love my students, but they're not strongest math and science background necessarily. This is something that you can deploy with that skill set, right? You just have to have a willingness to learn and you want to get better. And that's kind of where we are. So AI all over the place in wastewater now. And we see that quite a few folks are deploying AI-based solutions. There's sewer AI, Wincan has sewer Maddox, Clear Object today sponsor has Clear Vision for pipes. Uh, Jacobs has their own thing. All kind of platforms out there that are applying this AI to CCTV video. And what AI does is AI deploys a new set of eyes on traditional CCTV video and finds things that inspectors might miss. So AI can assess video quality, right? Um, the overall quality of a video. It can detect roots and measure the size of roots. Um, it can, you know, find defects that might be missed otherwise. It can do all kinds of things that can really accommodate some of those issues I talked about before, right? If you have a new crew of inspectors and they might not be good at PACP coding, a platform like Sewer AI can find those defects, code them for you and uh, sort of compensate for that inspector who might not be so good. You can have AI go through and do some analysis on the back end, right? And analyze uh, data collected by a bunch of inspectors to find differences between individuals or do other things like that. AI can actually go beyond the NASCO PACP specification, right? NASCO PACP has us come up with those defect codes and sometimes uh, people agree to disagree about what's fine roots and what's medium roots. AI can measure the roots, right? It can tell you this root ball is whatever, square centimeters of cross-sectional area or a volume of, you know, whatever cubic center. It gives you an actual number so it can kind of blow human inspectors out of the water. But the problem that I see um, as someone who works with this all the time, is that um, we think AI is magic because that's what we learned from Terminator and Star Wars and not always good magic, right? Sometimes it's kind of scary magic, but it's not. It's really a technology that's still in its infancy and it continues to develop and get better over time, but it's not perfect. And deploying AI in a way that's not thoughtful can actually increase your risk of problems if you're not careful. And what I mean by that is AI has certain systemic flaws or systemic issues right now that if you blindly deploy AI and say, I'm gonna get rid of all my TV operators and just throw an AI in there, there's a very good chance that that AI misses things that your humans were catching before and you're gonna increase your risk and give yourself a false sense of security. So some of that is what I wanna talk about today, right? Is how we can use that AI in a way that makes sense. I've got more videos of AI doing its AI thing, but this is what you see, right? AI going, video goes under the water. Look, the AI says underwater, figures it out so a human doesn't have to code that. AI finds the roots, measures the roots, tracks the roots, draws a green box around it. That's what AI can do right now. And AI can be massively parallel, right? So you can take AI, you can feed it a thousand TV videos all at once. And as long as you pay for cloud resources, the AI can go through and do its thing and like 
I showed this because I guess playing five videos conveys that sentiment, but like you could do 10,000 videos. It doesn't matter. The cloud is sort of an amazing and beautiful thing. Um, but really, when we look at, you know, the way in which that AI is working and we think about it, um, you know, on a fundamental level, my thesis is always that really the right place for AI is as part of a team with humans. I find that when AI is part of a team with talented humans, it's like Captain Planet, right? When their powers combine, they make better decisions than either humans alone or AI alone, right? There's things that AI will always find every day of the week better than humans, right? We found that in our system or in the clear object system, AI much better at measuring continuous defects for NASCO um, than humans. AI much better at finding changes in water level than humans. AI much better at navigating a complex scene and getting all the defects in there than humans. Uh, AI not always as good at humans as um, differentiating behind uh, different types of surface damage, right? Uh, making the distinction between spalling and aggregate visible, right? AI great at rebar, but some of those other things. Sometimes it'll get confused and think spalling is a light layer of grease. And we've seen that not just in clear objects platform, but in all of them. So combining those efforts is, you know, something that um, makes a ton of sense. And like, so the three images here, right? On the left, complex failure, AI can pick out everything in that complex failure where a human operator might get overwhelmed. The middle one, example of a pipe collapse, right? Human actually saw the pipe collapse here, but forgot to code it because he got an emergency service call. AI makes sure that that X is safely entered into the NASCO database. And another example, AI um, found a hole that an operator thought was a shadow at an area where a liner started in a pipe. They coded the material change to start of the liner. They didn't correctly identify that this was a hole. So just things that AI does well um, to complement a human who's also doing a good job. But it has problems, right? So this, I no names, right? I'm not gonna say which AI platform made these mistakes. But we did some benchmarking um, using different AI platforms with sample data has been uploaded. And one of the AI platforms, no names, said that this hole was fine roots, right? Obviously not fine roots. Um, if you have a talented inspector looking at a pipe in addition to AI, they can see that this is a hole. They can correct the AI. Business goes on as usual. But if you were relying solely on AI, that would be a problem, right? Uh, a different uh, section of pipe. We ran it through two AI software platforms. Again, no names. It's not a name and shame type webinar. Found no issue here, right? Just kept shooting the line, right? Didn't see that the pipe was broken. Didn't see that it was beginning to collapse. Didn't see that this was a major structural issue that should be addressed uh, imminently. Um, AI did great at the rest of the inspection. 90% of it did a fantastic job. 10% not so good, right? That 10% just happened to be pretty important. So what does that mean, right? That means like when you hear vendor claims, right? And I think it just makes sense to be careful, right? If someone tells you, if you buy our platform, you'll never need to watch another TV video. I don't think so. I think you probably still have some of that in your life, right? No one likes watching TV videos. I get it. That's why we hire EITs or interns, like make them watch all the videos, but still have to watch some of them. Maybe they don't have to watch all of them or they can jump around to areas where there's problems, but it's just not quite realistic. But to say an automated inspection platform catches every defect, I think now um, in 2024, that's a little bit overly optimistic. I think that error rate continues to go down as many of these software vendors get more and more training data. But in an industry where the tolerance for mistakes is pretty low, civil engineering, right? Because infrastructure collapse is catastrophic. Every defect, I think, is kind of tough, right? I think taking the human out of the loop uh, is a little bit uh, too much at this moment in time. And now I've heard some people say, look, you don't even have to pan and tilt when you see defects. Just have crews shoot the line. They can get three times the productivity kind of dangerous, right? We've all seen things like intruding taps that come in. And when you look around on the backside, you see there's a big void that you wouldn't have seen if you didn't pan and tilt. It's just one of those things that you can do, but you might be missing certain things. And I think the idea now is like, you know, would you trust chat GPT to, uh, you know, come up with a design for a sewer system? No, chat GPT could help with a lot of things, I'm sure, but I wouldn't put all of my trust in it. And the same is true for AI right now. AI is a great supplement. It makes good workers even better. It can probably compensate for bad workers, but would I get rid of all the workers and use an AI sewer platform? I would not do that at this time. Instead, I think what we have to really think about 
is the collaboration between humans and AI, right? What does that interface look like between technicians and AI? And I think when we think about TV inspectors, they are critical, right? They are firsthand eyes and ears on a system. You send a crew out and it rained the day before, they're smart enough to know what things they're seeing are a result of that wet weather event, right? Do they have problems? Yes, they're biased and inconsistent, but like AI is not gonna be smart enough to be like, oh yeah, look at this, this is probably from the rain yesterday, because it doesn't even know that right now. A couple years, will it know that? Probably, right? I'll never say AI is gonna be limited as time progresses, but as of today, it's just not the case. Um, you know, when we think about a good crew, here, the, a good operator of a robot, when they're inspecting a pipe, they ask them, what's your number one job? And they'll like smart mouth you a little bit because they're a good operator. But if you actually get them to take the question seriously, it boils down to it's driving the pipe, right? Driving the robot through the pipe. That is the number one thing they're there to do. They don't, most of them don't think in terms of data. Like I'm here to get good data. I'm here to drive the robot through the pipe because that's my job. I probably get a bonus based on footage or I know I need to get a thousand feet today. I'm going to get the robot through the pipe. Where that driving becomes difficult, where the robot gets stuck in the muck or the robot is navigating around debris, it's just like a pilot of an airplane. They get task saturation, right? You're not supposed to ask a pilot like chit chat questions when they're taking off or landing because their brain is full doing all the things they need to make sure we don't crash. Same thing with operators, right? When they're driving a robot trying to make sure it doesn't get stuck, now is not the time to be like, hey, buddy, need you to really code this change in water level. They're so focused on doing what needs to be done so the asset doesn't get stuck. Those things get missed. Could AI step in in those moments and help? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. And we know this is something that happens to operators all the time, right? Robots get stuck, codes get missed, complex failure, try to code everything, you miss some things. Um, and those kinds of things are really, really common. We always say, you know, you go to the NASCO training and NASCO is like, oh, you got to code changes in water level every 5%, please. You know what I mean? We know we want the guys to finish inspections. We don't want them to cut. We literally tell them to ignore their training because they need to get things done, right? If you had a guy who only got 500 feet a day of inspections done when his other crews are getting 1,200 because he's coding every water level change to 5%, you'd tell him to pack his bags, it's not working out, right? Then maybe he'll go be a great engineer somewhere, but practically it just doesn't make sense. So I think there are all these areas where we can bring in AI to kind of leverage the strengths of humans and fill in some of those weaknesses and make things a lot better. I mean, Claire Object did a great job sharing some data that I think uh, supports this thesis. So like the term that I think makes the most sense is decision support, right? If we do decision support, we don't have AI replacing humans, which is great if you're a union shop, because talk like that gets your grievances, but think about AI collaborating with humans. You still have a guy go through a pipe, slow down when he sees roots, pans and tilts appropriately, let the AI measure the size of the roots. So the guy doesn't have to type in RMJ, let the AI take care of that. Let the AI calculate the percent of cross-sectional area that's blocked by the root. Let it do that thing that it's really good at uh, so that the guy can focus on his job of driving the robot. If a guy's driving through and doesn't slow down, let the AI alert him and say, hey, something coming up on the right that we should probably take a look at, boss. All these ways in which they could work together and not necessarily displace you know, talented workers. AI can do a great job standardizing across multiple inspectors, right? So this is a project we did for a large municipality in Texas um, where we looked at uh, differences in uh, overall quality of uh, NASCO coding for human inspectors versus artificial intelligence. And um, what we found is something we all know, right? You go through a complex pipe, got a long continuous defect, that inspector is not coding every new crack every 20 feet because eventually they get fatigued and think someone's got to get the message. AI doesn't get fatigued. AI doesn't get tired. AI does all of that coding time over time. But more importantly, when you apply AI as a tool to evaluate your inspection crews, you can see the kinds of mistakes that individuals make when compared against an unbiased source, right? If you take your best TV guy, and you have them train everyone else, you're gonna get a bunch of people who are just like that best TV guy. And honestly, he probably has flaws or mistakes that he will accidentally pass on to everyone he's training. Using AI as a benchmark lets you train people against an unbiased source, and more importantly, lets you provide that training rapidly, right? 
when I was at Red Zone, we would always bring in crews uh, to work with the data team usually every six months. And they'd say, hey, take a look at this. You know, you coded this wrong. You missed these things. And honestly, they just kind of stare at you, right? And they'd be like, uh, you know, buddy, I inspected this six months ago. Like, you're telling me I forgot a route. Okay, I got things to do. I'm going to go get lunch. With AI, you can run that analysis immediately so that people can see uh, mistakes in their coding with a feedback loop that's the next day, right? You could say, hey, operator, we analyzed your work the day before. Here's some things that were missed. As you go out and hit the field today, try and focus on these things to correct the mistakes from yesterday, right? It doesn't have to be a punitive. It can just be a nice little oversight tool that kind of helps make people better. Same thing here. This is a matrix we did for a municipality where we basically found that TV inspectors are just like professors, right? Some people give everyone A's, some people fail the whole class. And if you can standardize or use AI to make inspections across all those individuals consistent, it's much easier for you to evaluate a data set, right? In this case, we're looking at 300,000 feet of historical data. We found a bunch of problems and things that needed to be corrected, but then we found that actually one guy uh, was grading things worse. I don't know if it's this guy, right? We sort of anonymized and changed the names because our goal is not to, again, name and shame, but one guy was grading everything worse. When we standardized things using AI, you could see how defects were actually distributed across the system instead of just having the harshest grader uh, find the most problem. So it's really useful for tools like that. I mentioned earlier that the operator's number one job driving the robot, right? AI can step in when they start to get cognitively overloaded. So these are some examples of some interesting things that ClearVision does with their AI platform. So ClearVision's AI platform is a little bit different than some of the others. It does the same image classification, draws green boxes on defects, super good at that. But it also uses visual odometry to analyze the robot's telemetry. So the pressure inside the robot body, the speed the robot is moving, if there's any change in trajectory, if it goes over bumps or seems to get stuck in the mud. And it uses that to help train its AI models. So these are two examples of things uh, that were found in the clear object system that weren't coded by any AI platform and they weren't coded by the human, right? So what happens in the first case is this is a robot following a jetter. So a pipe that's been cleaned, there's stuff in the invert of the pipe. It's obviously debris, but what kind of debris is it? The system by looking at robot movement, sees the robot go up and over the debris and knows that it's something rigid, right? Probably some concrete that was left in the invert. You jet it as many times as you want. It's never gonna go anywhere because it's concrete. So someone's either gonna come in and break it up or it's gonna be there forever. But using those tools, like looking at how the robot moves can help identify those things. By contrast, on the right, right, the robot starts getting stuck in debris, gets stuck in the muck. Uh, it actually visually looks very similar to this. How does the AI know that this is soft debris encoded appropriately? It looks at how the robot gets stuck in the muck, right? Driving full speed ahead, NASCO 30 feet a minute. All of a sudden, you slow down as you go through this debris. That's how the AI can learn that it's soft debris. So again, in this case, the operator didn't code anything because they're busy driving the robot over the obstruction so it didn't tip over or plowing it through the debris, AI can jump in and do that defect coding that gets missed, right? Again, it's the pilot situation where the cognitive overload, when the operators focus on driving, the AI can step in and use some advanced techniques to make sure that nothing gets misses. This is, so what does it look like, right? You look at how the robot's moving and you can actually get a plot of how the robot's moving over time, right? So when there's these horizontal lines on the graph, robot not moving at all, when it angles up a little bit, robot starts to move. Other plateaus, you can tell when the robot's not moving. This is so easy, right? Train the AI to take a look. When the robot's not moving or the robot's going back and forth, you don't see any codes, there's probably something going on, right? If the robot's not moving, either it's stuck or the operator saw uh, someone pretty walk by on the street and went to take a smoke break and look at them, right? But it's a great place to focus that. If all of a sudden the robot's not moving and there's no defects, you see that stop and start motion because it's stuck, a great place to focus the AI on coding. What does that let you do? It lets you cut the price of AI dramatically, right? If instead of running an AI classifier on every millisecond of video, you only turn on that classifier to look at those key moments, you can cut price by an order of magnitude and make AI much more affordable. 
you could take a look here and find some issues that people wouldn't code, right? In this case, we had a great operator who was using the crawler to build up a wall of water and then release it to clear some debris out so he could finish his inspection. The AI finds this high water level, this water level build up. The AI sees the robot kind of turns to the side. The AI sees this release and can identify that this ad hoc in situ cleaning event happened, right? There's no NASCO code for that, but the AI can make a note and say, hey, something interesting happened here, right? This operator in an effort to get through this line did some practice in the pipe that maybe other people should take a look at uh, that's just good information to know. So it's a way AI can go beyond NASCO to return some interesting results, right? This is a great one, right? This is a good example. We had a operator, who driving through straight line up, right? All these dots on the left, driving, coding, driving, coding, driving, coding, all of a sudden slows way down and stops coding, right? What's going on? He's trying to do the old limbo, right? There's grease in the crown. He doesn't want to get grease on the lens because he knows the inspection's over after that. It'll get rejected because it's all smeary. So he does what a good operator does and like limbo's under and turns the camera and tilts it away and then finishes the inspection successfully but forgets to code the grease at the crown, right? Again, perfect use of AI to come in and code that grease because it detects the operator getting cognitively overloaded and doing some work that's not coding, right? Did the AI get all these earlier codes in the pipe when everything was fine, perfect? Maybe, maybe not, but it stepped in where it counted, right? The operator was doing a good job early on in the pipe, going at 30 feet per minute, no problem, good NASCO inspection. But then all of a sudden, when he started to get jammed up, that's where he made his mistake, and that's where AI could kind of jump in. Another good example, this is from Ohio, right? Complex failures, even a good operator is going to miss something here. In this case, the operator codes the ragging, codes circumferential cracks, even figures out this tap here is active. Uh, didn't see the forest through the trees and code this as broken pipe, right? AI can jump in and make sure that no codes are missed, right? It can measure the size of holes um, that it finds. It can use that visual odometry to tell the difference between infiltration, infiltration that's a stain versus infiltration that's running because it knows how the robot moves and it knows how water moves. I mean, it can make a good operator better but it's not really a replacement for the operator altogether, right? There's things that AI does that really complement some of those weaknesses. And there's things that AI does, um, you know, that it's still not perfect at. Like, would I want to rely solely on AI catching every defect in here? I don't know that I'm comfortable with that, right? I don't know that AI gets that this tap is active when it gets overwhelmed with everything that's going on, right? As AI draws those green boxes, sometimes information can be left out. So my personal comfort level is a good operator paired with AI to make sure that nothing gets missed. Great things AI can do is it can automatically identify sags. So AI can tell when the water level starts low, goes up, and then goes right back down again and identify a sag in a pipe. So if you want to do new construction acceptance testing, AI is a lot better than a human operator, especially sometimes you get like a little conflict of interest, right? So I'm a contractor. I put in the pipe. I think everything looks great. I'm the municipality. I do my inspection. All of a sudden, I want to reject a bunch of stuff. How do I know that uh, the municipality isn't just rejecting stuff to try to get a price break, right? They, they swear they'd never do it, but I'm a contractor. I'm suspicious of everyone because people try to screw me every day. So I got to be alert. AI can be that unbiased source, right? It can identify SAGs without having a human make a judgment call. And it can do it automatically without someone needing to say, okay, water level at 5%, water level at 30%, water level back down to 10%. It can just do it. So no one needs to spend the time thinking and coding and thinking and coding. It's another good example. And then um, uh, kind of wrap things up with some concluding thoughts. So good example. So this graph shows both the water level with the blue line and the speed of the robot with the gray line. And you see two things in these graphs, which again, the AI is trained on, right? The AI can see water level go up in a pipe and the AI can see the robot start to stop and plateau, right? we look at the video, it becomes obvious what's happening, right? When we see the robot drive through and start going through a pipe where everything starts out low flow, and then the flow starts to go up and up and up, and then eventually the flow gets to be more than half of the pipe capacity, and we MSA the inspections, we get a beta. What's going on? There's debris, right? 
We know there's debris below the flow. We know that's going to have an impact. It's going to lead to, that's exactly what's causing the situation. There's a loss of capacity, causes the robot to get stuck in MSA, right? According to NASCO, the operator shouldn't code anything because they can't see it, right? The operator should not code this DSZ, right? They should say MSA flow levels high, but AI can supplement that operator knowledge with what it knows about how robots behave in pipes, right? The AI can either return something in a separate database or make an MGO that says suspecting debris below the flow uh, that led to the inspection being in, uh, impacted, right? That's what AI can do that an operator wouldn't do. So again, when their powers combine and they work together, you really get a solution that's much more effective at understanding contextually what's happening inside a sewer um, rather than just doing pure strict NASCO codes all the time at Sonar, right? You don't wanna pay for Sonar. AI, I'm not saying AI is a replacement for Sonar, but I'm saying, hey, in this case, you don't need to do Sonar to figure out there's debris here. The AI can tell you that, uh, no problem. I mean, other things like, you're starting to get what I'm saying. AI is great at detecting continuous defects, things that wander. Um, AI can um, really work to help people make better decisions overall. But I think the main point is like, based on what we see uh, in the market right now, AI to me doesn't seem like it's something that replaces um, uh, a good TV truck or a good TV crew or a good inspector. What I think AI does is AI allows you to get some immediate benefits today by using it to supplement that good human crew, right? Use it as a decision support software, right? Use a tool like Clear Vision that can work to make it so that someone doesn't need to review hundreds of hours of TV inspection, but maybe only looks at the 10 worst lines because AI can say, hey, out of everything we looked at yesterday, these ones are the worst. These ones all look fine. Spend your time looking at these ones. We've seen huge turnover, right? Now where I am, Sheets uh, convenience store, right? Uh, Southwestern Pennsylvania Sheets, far better than Wawa, right? I just say it up front. Um, pays people crazy money to work at a convenience store, right? So what this means is that uh, inspectors, there's turnover, right? Because they're in demand and people uh, getting, uh, you know, you. so you beat up an inspector for missing their NASCO codes and they're gonna say, screw you. I'm gonna go get a job with another firm. I'm gonna go work at Sheets and I'll get paid what I'm getting paid already. Um, the market is tough. So AI is something you can do. So you're not beating up inspectors for making mistakes. You can use AI to complement the inspector um, and help correct them. And even, you know, sometimes you have someone who's a, a great field guy, but maybe not a great inspector. You just kind of accept that and use AI to compensate for their weaknesses. What we found is that in a couple studies, when you use a platform like ClearVision, uh, using the human and AI combined takes all those defects that are typically missed and reduce that count by 90%. What's scary is many of those missed defects were the NASCO fours and fives, right? The broken pipe, the whole soil visible. They weren't just like little fine roots that were getting missed. I mean, they're a big deal. And if you get good AI, you can really empower. Oh, look what a statement that is. Empower everyone. Wow. It's like changing the world. So I think it's like the right mix for AI and proactive CCTV. And like, I don't want to get everyone at NASCO mad at me, but like if I was a municipality and I was buying my first TV truck ever, right? I'm spending the money, I'm gonna do it. And I'm strapped for cash because this was a big deal. Maybe I had a push camera before. Now I'm getting the truck, I'm getting the Envirosite Rover, whatever I'm getting, like I'm gonna do it. And I had to look at how to get the most bang for my buck would I spend the money I have left to get all my operators PACP certified so they could code defects fine? Or would I invest in an AI tool? And for me, right out of the gate, I might make that investment in an AI tool because that's going to encourage my crews to really use this new crawler, push it through the pipe, get as much footage as they can, start looking at my system and start measuring things quantitatively. So I know that AI will be a good baseline I can keep falling back on. Maybe later I'll get everyone PACP trained so they get better. Like if you're starting from scratch and you don't have a mentor there, it's tough to go from no inspections to now there's this NASCO coding and like it's it kind of overwhelming. So it could be a great thing to do as you're getting started for the first time, right? I also think when you're gonna buy AI platform, there's things you need to do to um, really make sure that vendor claims are true. Trust but verify. 
I know, um, you know, uh, I've done a lot of work studying different AI platforms. I appreciate the transparency that ClearObject shows. They're very open about the mistakes their AI makes. They have an audit trail so you can see when someone overwrote the AI. A lot of people right now in the industry, here's the dark secret, right? AI works really well, but almost everyone's got like a room full of people checking the AI overnight, right? Sometimes overseas, but they log in, they all check. Everyone does it, right? They don't like to talk about it because um, that's really not the image of AI in the future. But one nice thing about a platform like ClearVision is they'll show you the times where maybe the AI made a mistake and a human had to flip the switch so that you know what's actually going on with the system um, and things like that, right? But I mean, it can lead to huge savings, um, you know, as you work through it. So, you know, I, I just think everyone will tell you their AI platform will change the world and do all these things. I just think you gotta be smart about it, ask the right questions. Different platforms will be right for different applications and different uses. I don't think there's a one size fits all, but um, you know, a couple questions that I saw uh, come in the chat that I'll just, you know, mention now is like getting started with AI for inspection. The nice thing about AI is it's something that you can implement, you know, turnkey. You can buy a subscription to a package for a, you know, annual basis of a couple thousand dollars a year and then churn through as much footage as you want, right? Some people will charge you by foot. Some people will charge you flat rate. But as soon as you get that package, you can start loading video through it. So even if you're small, as long as you've got videos, you can start feeding those videos into AI uh, and start making a, a difference. If you don't have videos, I would say that's the, the distinction. If you're a small municipality and you don't have CCTV, I wouldn't buy AI because the AI really needs to look at that CCTV. But if you have a bunch of um, legacy data or a file cabinet, you can shove the AI on that and it'll start learning from your actual inspections, um, which is a great thing. A lot of AI platforms, as you're getting started, have limitations and requirements. Some of the newer ones work with only the latest and greatest high definition cameras and stuff. I know Clear Vision works with the old standard definition NTSC cameras. So if you have an older platform or maybe you digitize some tapes and there's some interlacing artifacts, you'll need to be careful to choose a platform that's compatible with that. So um, I know I saw some questions come in. I kind of wanted to sell you on the sizzle of AI, but also show you that you still got to be strategic and smart about it, right? But implementing AI in conjunction with some other things, I mean, it's a game changer. It can really elevate the quality of your inspection staff. Just, you know, uh, it's not time to get rid of everyone and replace them with robots, but man, a robot can sure help them do their job a lot better. I always say at home, right? My wife is not here, so this is safe, though I'm sure someone will tell her now that I'm saying it. Super good at so many things, right? Would I want a robot to replace her? Absolutely not, but man, the Roomba sure helps, right? She can focus on all those other things. The Roomba can make sure we stay vacuumed, but again, it's no replacement for her. It never could be a replacement for her, and her vacuuming is great, by the way, but like, it's kind of nice having the Roomba around. Um, I think that's a good metaphor for the state of AI right now. So we've got time left, guys. We've got 10 minutes. If anyone has any questions, feel free to dump them in. I'm happy to talk about anything you want. I get excited about this stuff. Um, so anything you want to talk about? Well, I left a um, YouTube link in the comments for a drone inspection. I think you remember doing this, Justin, because you're in the video. Um, a, yeah. a drone inspection that we did for Fishers, Indiana. And I just also wanted to say, um, if anybody would like to schedule some time with our team to talk about your um, use case, um, email sales at clearobject.com. And shameless plug, I wrote a book on this, buy it. It's really good. It's kind of expensive, but like, it's a good book. So the Amazon link is in there. Um, shameless plug. You don't have to buy the book. I'll talk your ear off, but shameless plug. Did we already answer the one question in there? Yes, we did. Okay. Yeah, I answered what's in the Q&A. So if anyone has anything else, I mean, you could shout them out. I feel like we can manage this or you type them in, but uh, we got 10 minutes. So I'm happy to talk about anything that's interesting to the group. Otherwise, uh, you can just X out and have a great day. But if you have questions, love to kind of jump in and talk about your particular situation. Hey, Justin, one that came in actually uh, before the meeting hey. that I forgot to pop into Q&A was, um, was, hey, I, it was basically summarizing it. Hey, I understand how this stuff works. I think it's cool. How do I get my boss to agree to it? So wondering if you have any tips or things to really get 
like the, the, yeah. the decision makers to get on board? The biggest thing is people think AI is going to cost like six figures to implement and it's not right. A lot of folks make AI very affordable where again, it could be a couple thousand bucks a year for a subscription. Some people do unlimited footage. So like the it just clear your mind and think like the barrier to getting involved in this is not necessarily 250k you can do it for a lot less but the other thing i would say is reach out like janine put that sales in there reach out to someone who does ai have ready some examples of your cctv inspection videos and be ready to share them and what i think all the platforms will do is run your videos through show you an example of the way that ai can find mistakes or find defects and then help you put together those roi calculations like i think most major platforms now can say hey if you show us these images, we'll show you the time savings AI would have had. And then you can go to your boss and say, look, this will save Jerry, um, who, the guy who reviews the TV footage, at least eight hours a week. So we could hire another intern or do whatever. You can kind of show the ROI from the software. And I think that everyone will be happy to help you. I know Clear Vision would be happy to help you. It's very straightforward. Um, I saw someone else ask, do you get a defect report after AI reviews the footage? Yeah, absolutely you do. Um, just like an old WinCan um, uh, report you would get or a CCTV report. Can I share in here, guys? Is that okay? Like, can I share my yeah. screen? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me stop the presentation. There we go. So like just an example, and I can't speak to everyone, but I'll just show an example of one actual um, thing that you get from um, uh, TV inspection. So Chrome tab, I think this is dashboard. Yeah, here it is. So this is uh, somewhere they're actually using Clear Vision. It's Olathe, Kansas. Good people love Kansas, don't love the ice storms, uh, but kind of is what it is. What Clear Vision can do and AI platforms can do is they can triage these inspections. So they can say, hey, out of all your inspections, everything looks good. Look, A, B, C, let's actually take a look at the D inspections, right? Those are the ones that maybe we want to spend some more time digging into and seeing what the problems are. Um, you can sort and filter and all that stuff, but you kind of click into them. And what you get from most of the AI platforms are reports that both show you all those NASCO codes that were found, anything that says inspector, but anything that the AI found also, and it can be a PDF or whatever. It can show you some of those graphs of distance versus time, like I mentioned, the water level, but all of it typically now is in a web platform, but then you can also do a PDF just like you would uh, for anyone else. You can share it or review it or flag it, um, but it'll give you a PDF report that should be very familiar. Uh, if you've used WinCan or PipeLogix or Granite, it's super, super similar. You can also dig in in a little bit more detail and really see what the AI does. Not all the tools like do this, but I know Clear Vision does, and I really like it. So you can click through and see all the defects that were found both by the inspector and by the AI and see what's going on. So like here, it's gonna look in this connection and find some roots. I love that you can kind of jump around and see them and see what's going on. You can see this defective tap, but you can also see at a glance everything that the AI found, everything that the inspector found. And if you happen to disagree, you can say, hey, I don't, I'm not gonna do this. This is customer data. You can reject the AI conclusion and update the model. So let's say we're looking at this and the AI is messing up over and over and it's saying these cobwebs are actually roots. You can train it to not make that mistake by just clicking no and rejecting the defect and it'll kind of get better over time. So this isn't necessarily a sales pitch for Clear Vision, though I think it's a great tool and it's actually one of the best ones out there, um, but it's just an example of what that AI assisted workflow looks like um, and how you could leverage that and use the tools. Oh, I meant to share a new tab, sorry. So um, when you click into it, uh, da, 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 there we go, one more, it opens a new tab. So uh, one more, yep, I got it. We we're just joking today, huh? I'm a boomer. There it is. So you can click into it like this, right? So you can see all the defects. You can click in. You can see what the AI does, what the inspector does over here. You can click into it and reject the defect and say, hey, I don't want to look at this one. And then it'll actually use what you've rejected to update the model. So you can see here, it's going to figure out that this tap is defective. It's going to find the roots that are growing in around the tap. It's going to figure out, you know, every, so it sees everything, even though the guy who's coding it is focusing on the tap, clear vision notices the roots 
and all that stuff. They didn't have to upgrade to a new high definition camera. Uh, it works with their standard definition camera and does all of it automatically. So uh, that's just sort of a quick demo um, of how it works. So I hope that answered the question. I saw that Rick asked that about the defect report. Any other questions, y'all? Well, Justin, thank you so much. That was incredibly informative. Yeah, thanks, guys. This is a lot of fun. If you send Janine an email at that sales, if you have a question for me, she'll pass it on. I'm happy to talk about anything wherever. So thanks for joining, guys. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.